another con of marriage is that you cannot be an individualized version of yourself. So you have to share your time, your energy, your space, mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to sacrifice in a healthy way. So a lot of us self-sacrifice in order to get the things that we want, but we do it from this place of lack, this place of overwhelm, this place of fear. And you have to learn how to make sacrifices that are for the good of the whole while not always getting what it is that you want as an individual. Mm -hmm. And so what I have found is that single women who prefer married men generally fall into one of two categories. The first is the emotionally unavailable woman who mm. prefers a married man because he is also emotionally unavailable. He's not going to give you his full self because he has a wife and home and all of that. And if you're a single woman who's been hurt in the past, who has experienced any level of trauma or intimate abuse from men in the past, there's often a part of that fear that's still there. And so if I can control this situation in some way and sort of turn off a part of my emotional aspect, then this works for me. That's the first category. The second category is. She has been seen on New York Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, Huffington Pro Post, MSN, all the major outlets. Uh, she's been everywhere. So this woman is phenomenal. Had a chance to listen to had a chance to listen to her on uh, Montoya Smith's uh, podcast, Mental Dialogue. I was listening. I said, OK, that's it. Got to make sure I have her. So it's an honor to have her as today's guest. New York's finest Bravehearts community. Let's show some love to Phyla Antoine. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Very well, Sean. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great intro. I love that. For sure. That, that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and, you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> and today's topic, should, should you get married? Like in this day and age, I think this is a prevalent, I, I really think this is something that needs to be discussed because with uh, the way people get married at uh, an older age, and even the way people talk about marriage today is almost as if like it's like it's outdated. I'm just like, wow, like really? I feel like a dinosaur. Um, so I want to jump into this topic. Well, first of all, who inspired you to become the woman you are today? You know what? It's not one who, because I was raised by a tribe of really beautiful, powerful, strong black women. So my mother is one of 11 children and my grandmother, whom I'm named after, she was the matriarch of that family. And she was the type of woman that just her presence was healing to you. There was love in everything that she did. And she always preached to us the importance of family, community, and sharing what you have and what you know with others. So I would have to credit who I am to my grandmother and my mother and all of my aunties who helped to have a hand in raising me. Awesome. Love it. And, and what inspired you to get into this space with relationships and marriages and building up women? You know, there are some things that are so natural to you that you don't recognize it's the thing you're supposed to do. And I've always been the one in the group, in the family, um, in the friend space that was able to rationalize things really well. And that could always kind of pinpoint what the red flags were in dating, in just regular life situations. And I've had some life experiences that sort of redirected me into this place. But I believe that this is a part of my gift, a part of my calling. And when I found myself in a place where I was really living in a healthy, loving, monogamous relationship, I was able from that position to see so many other women who didn't have that and who didn't have any idea what it would take to get there. And it felt like it was my responsibility, my duty, um, and also my privilege to share this with them. Mm, that's good. I love it. I love it. Um, what are some of the pros and cons of getting married in today's society? 
You know, so let's start with one of the biggest cons because I like to be real and raw and honest in my conversations so that people do not have unrealistic expectations. As far as what I have experienced personally and what I see professionally and working with Black women who are accomplished and ambitious and successful, the hardest thing which I would position as a con to getting married is that. Are you a content creator, YouTuber? Maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really, really good. Or maybe you said something that was really, really good. Well, enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I want to share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and let you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you. Individualized version of yourself. So you have to share your time, your energy, your space, mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to sacrifice in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us self-sacrifice in order to get the things that we want, but we do it from this place of lack, this place of overwhelm, this place of fear. And you have to learn how to make sacrifices that are for the good of the whole, while mm -hmm. not always getting what it is that you want as an individual. And also, I think another con is that marriage is a long-term commitment. And in this era and in this day and age, we have the shortest attention spans ever. Folks want instant gratification. And in marriage, you may not get the gratification for five years after doing the work and maybe even longer sometimes, depending on what the vision is and what you're build building for your household. But being able to put yourself in a position where you are challenged as far as your ideology and who you think you are, having to sacrifice and having to make that long-term commitment. I think those are the things that people would see as the biggest cons to marriage. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because, and, and I tell people with the divorce rate, with the way it is today, it's like, do you really want to gamble? <laughs> you sure? I say, <laughs> take the risk, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no risk no reward that's true too that's true too because marriage can be rewarding it can you know once you my old mentor he used to tell me he used to say sean great marriages aren't found they're built and in this culture and the society that we live in people just want the the amazon marriage right they just want it delivered on their doorstep and they you know so are you willing to put in a necessary work I think, to to make that relationship work because it's going to be some tough seasons. Oh, absolutely. Because you're living and doing life with another individual, mm -hmm. right? But on the side of the pros, marriage is also one of the best teachers in the world. It is an accelerated course in personal growth. It allows you to have company, partnership, and companionship while you are doing life and going through life challenges and life's joys. It can help you to become a version of yourself you would not have access to if you decide to stay single. And it's how you create a family legacy. Marriage needs to be a foundational practice in any community that's going to survive. And because we see what the Black community and communities of color have gone through because of the lack of marriage, I think that should be something that we begin to really discuss on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Because I'm, I'm always an advocate for healthy marriages. You know, 
I do believe that marriage is the backbone to society to, you know, I do believe that even still, even in, even in 2024. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree. Uh, what are some red flags that might indicate a couple should hold off on marriage? <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Mm -hmm. I knew a couple who had been together for many years. They were engaged. They were planning their wedding and it was maybe few months, not even few months, a couple months before the wedding. So let's say two, two and a half months. And the soon-to-be bride found out that the soon-to-be groom had a whole other family life relationship situation. But because there was only two months in that countdown, they went ahead and had the beautiful wedding. And then I guess decided to deal with those challenges in the marriage, which is what a lot of people do. So I say that to say, even though we are going to give some red flags, most people are going to ignore them because they care more about what other people are thinking than they do about actually having a healthy, happy marriage. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to decide what's most important to you first and foremost. And then if you really want to have the healthy foundation and you are looking out for those red flags, it would be the basic things like communication. Mm -hmm. Are we communicating with one another? Are we able to express our feelings, our wants and our needs? And is the partner receptive to us? If not, that is an absolute red flag because how can you do the rest of your life with someone who doesn't listen to you or doesn't talk to you, mm -hmm. right? Another red flag is if any of the partners are more concerned about the wedding than they are about the relationship. So many women in particular, and I'm going to talk to my sisters here, see men as accessories and see marriage as a box to check off on their to-do list. It's what I'm supposed to do. It will give me kudos and props from my network and my community. I'll be pretty. I can post pictures on Instagram. And that's the main concern. So if either one of those individuals is not concerned with the actual marriage and not doing that work, and it's all about the party and the wedding, that's a red flag. And it's also a red flag if you are not able to have a clear conversation about the future of your relationship and what marriage looks like to each partner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, because we don't have those conversations when it comes to getting married. It's just like, I feel butterflies. It's on. That's all I need to feel the butterflies. The butterflies and the, and the, and the sex was good. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he fine. <laughs> right. And I have a whole <laughs> other perspective about what I think about butterflies. So let's talk about it then since we're here. Yes. So butterflies don't always mean this is a good fit. Right. Butterflies are a signal from your body that something about this situation needs your attention. It doesn't mean it's good or bad. You have mm -hmm. to evaluate where the butterflies are coming from because your body is a compass. Mm -hmm. It's always going to show you where you are and tell you what direction you need to go in. So for some people, the butterflies means, oh, this is the same toxic energy that we felt with Bobby or Karen or Shauna or Jack. Sometimes the butterflies is saying there's danger here, right? Mm -hmm. Other times the butterflies may be saying, this feels familiar. I remember this. So butterflies are not an instant uh, connective thing. It doesn't mean that you have chemistry and there's a connection. It means that your body is trying to tell you something and you need to take a moment to stop and listen to figure that thing out. Wow. I never heard that before. Because <laughs> I just hear the Michael Jackson butterflies, you know, that we just, <laughs> that's all we hear. You know, we just, butterflies are always a great thing. Mm-hmm. That's what we think. But you think about those times where you're doing something new and you get nervous and you start getting those rumbles and those butterflies in your belly. The result ain't always pretty. Wow. <laughs> I love it. That is so good. Yeah. You just done messed up somebody's whole relationship. <laughs> right. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. They like, I had butterflies and now, now <laughs> it's a compass, huh? <laughs> I love that. That's good. Have you have you ever seen a couple and you were like, 
they are ready. They are ready for marriage. And if if not, like, what are some keys to let you know that this couple is ready for marriage? Mm -hmm. So it's okay for couples to have some level of apprehension and some trepidation, some fear, right? That's always normal. Mm -hmm. um, when I do see couples who are ready for marriage, the key component in that relationship is open communication. Mm -hmm. And it seems like such a simple principle, but that's because if the communication is there, you can overcome so many things. You can remove so many blocks and barriers. So the couples that I look at and I say, oh, wow, they're really ready to take it to the next level are those who are able to clearly communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. And in their communication, there is emotional intelligence. They're not bickering. They're not going back and forth. One is able to be silent and listen while the other one speaks. They're able to figure out emotionally what's happening in this space. And you have one partner who is clearly operating from a feminine energy, emotional space, and another partner who's clearly operating from a rational, masculine space. Those are the dynamics that I look at and I say, oh, this is a mature couple. They're ready to take that next step if they desire to and then there's everybody else <laughs> yeah because there's people that's married that, that don't have communication down so that part mm -hmm. yeah. so if you can get that in before marriage and the emotional intelligence is something that uh we lack like people you know we, we can even see that from just a social media perspective right mm -hmm. I mean, somebody say one thing and it just starts a fire and uh it's it, it it's tough communication with these devices in our hands communication is is still tough it is and the devices make communication tougher we're talking to each other we're talking at each other but we're not communicating because in order for us to clearly communicate there has to be an actual connection i have to care about what you're saying you have to care about what i'm saying there's patience in that right mm -hmm. there's stability in that. And so there are all these emotionally intelligent things that need to be in place in order for the communication to really work. And that's why it's so challenging for most people. Mm, yeah, it is. Because I, I know I've struggled with it. Lord knows. Mm -hmm. Like, just harnessing my emotions, just making sure that I'm actually listen, listening uh, before I fly off the handle. Or if there's mm -hmm. something that my wife say to me, and I start to, I, I feel something like right here. I'm just like, mm, mm, mm. yeah. And I'm just learning how to, you know what? Let me, let me hear what she has to say. And let mm -hmm. me repeat back to you what you said. So that way I hear it three times. Right, right. I've heard it. Most of us are, are communicating with ourselves in those moments. And so you become triggered based on the internal conversation you're having. And then you lash out who you're talking to. Because it's something that you remembered from six years ago, not really about what's happening right now. So we do have to learn how to manage our emotions in the process of communicating with our partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a show within itself with this communication. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any benefits of premarital counseling? Oh, of course, of course. You know, mediation is so powerful because there's a non-biased person in the space who can help you figure out what you're feeling and what you want to say, and then who can help you communicate that to your partner. And that is beneficial for both of the individuals in the relationship. Of course, the other benefit is that there is someone in the room who can help you all navigate the space that you're in when those emotions do come up, when the triggers do come up. And this is, of course, given that you're working with a licensed counselor or a coach or you know, a married elder who has experience in some way so that they can give you some strategies, give you some tools, help guide you in that emotional space and that process. I think that all couples should go through some level of coaching or therapy or counseling before they get married, simply so that they learn the mechanisms to move through challenges and struggle within the relationship dynamic, because those times are going to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do. I really do believe in premarital counseling because there's a lot of people that just forego it. They just like, I'm good. I'm going to have Elvis marry us. We're going to go to Vegas. We good. Right. You know, <laughs> and 
and I'm just like, man, I, you know, and, and again, like I said, therapy is important too. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I've learned over time is uh, my wife and I, we have our individual therapist, but, and then we have our marriage therapist mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because you got to work through those personal issues, you know? Um, if Absolutely. You just, yeah. If you jump in just, if you just jump into th the therapy session, you still have things that you have to work out from personal right. perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. so, and I think that's why marriage counseling sometimes doesn't work, as people say. It's mm -hmm. not that the, the counseling is not working. It's that the individuals are not where they need to be individually in order for this togetherness to happen. My husband and I, we've done personal development courses and workshops and things individually and together. and you know, there's coaching and there's all types of things that you can do. So if the therapy aspect or the coaching component or the counseling component doesn't sound right to you, there are so many resources, but I absolutely recommend that couples take the time to find one of those resources, at least to work on themselves individually and then together as well. Mm -hmm. Kudos to you and wifey. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been some tough seasons. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> it's been I'm tough. sure. How long have you two been married? It is going on seven years this October, um, but I was previously married for 15 years before mm. going through the divorce, you know, hence scary to be married. Yeah. Uh, so I've, you know, been on the both ends of the spectrum of, you know, newlyweds, but then going through a divorce and starting over. So mm -hmm. that yeah. takes a, a lot of courage. So I commend you. I commend you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's yeah, and that's another one. I, I could talk to you all day about that. <laughs> uh, what advice do you have for couples who are considering alternative partnerships or lifestyles instead of traditional marriages? That there needs to be clear communication about what each partner wants, needs, and sees for their relationship before the commitment is made. That is the best way to address those concerns. And what I often see is that people will say, you know, well, maybe I want to do it this way, but I'll wait until I've massaged him or I've massaged her in and we're in it for three months, six months, three years. And then we talk about this and it causes breakdown in the relationship, not simply because it's been initiated, but because someone feels like they've been misled. Right. And it's much easier to have the conversations earlier on to say, this is who I am. This is what I'm considering. Would you be open to this at any point in the relationship or in the marriage? And I've seen relationships where one partner has said, okay, has conceded to the idea later on, mm -hmm. but the relationship was just full of resentment, even though they stayed together and they opened up the marriage to other partners there was this resentment between the two primary partners and that seeped into everything else. So have the conversation early on, have the courage to be truthful about who you are and what you want and be respectful enough for let, to let people decide if they want to get on your train or not. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Because sometimes people will, they will start monogamous Mm -hmm. And then the marriage bed kind of goes south a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then mostly the mostly men, right? Hey, babe, I have an idea. And that's when, you know, stuff hit the fan, let alone all the other issues you had being monogamous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And I'm always like, if you are not emotionally intelligent and in touch with yourself enough to have a relationship with one person, Mm. What do you think is going to happen when you have two, three, and four in the mix? It's going to be a whole shit show. <laughs> For real, yeah, I, yeah, I've had guys talk to me about, you know, I, I you know, I, I want to be, I want to have other women, and all. I'm like, really, one? So you're not good with one? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know. There's so many other components to that than just the intimacy aspect, and most folks are only thinking about the sexual aspect, the intimacy component. Yep. But if you are a man, and let's say you are supposed to be the provider within that relationship, how are you now going to provide for additional wives and additional children? Or if you're a woman who wants to bring someone into the relationship, what does that look like for the intimacy between you and par your partner now? 
because now it shifts, now it changes. Is it just one-on-one? Is everybody involved? So there needs to be these conversations. And even though they are uncomfortable, they have to be had and folks have to get uncomfortable in order to really decide what part of it they want to implement or whether or not it should stay a fantasy. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's good. There was, okay, so this question is, is, it's controversial, but I think it's, I would love to hear your feedback on this. Okay. There's uh, been conversations about single women who prefer married men because they, the, the wife has trained the married man. So it makes it easier for the other woman to be with the, the married man. Mm -hmm. Right. Now to me, I'm, I'm just like, I get it, but I'm just like, you can't expect for this to, to turn out right. Right. You know, but but what what are your thoughts on that? Because I've heard that a lot. I don't know if I don't know. It's, I've heard it a couple of times before. Like, mm -hmm. OK, he's married, but I prefer a married man because I don't have to do the necessary work. Well, I call bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> totally and completely. Yeah. And what I have found and again. I hear women's secrets in my work. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hear what their heart of heart says, what their soul calls out to them, what they really want versus what they do. Mm -hmm. And so what I have found is that single women who prefer married men generally fall into one of two categories. The first is the emotionally unavailable woman who mm -hmm. prefers a married man because he is also emotionally unavailable. He's not going to give you his full self because he has a wife and home and all of that. And if you're a single woman who's been hurt in the past, who has experienced any level of trauma or intimate abuse from men in the past, there's often a part of that fear that's still there. And so if I can control this situation in some way and sort of turn off a part of my emotional aspect, then this works for me. That's the first category. The second category is the unworthy woman, the one who doesn't believe that she deserves her own man, who doesn't think that life, life, God, love will bring her, her own man because she has deep rooted insecurities and feelings of inadequacy. Even if on the surface she got it all together and she has her own money and she's driving the nice car and has the degrees and work and all of that, mm -hmm. there's a feeling of mm -hmm. hopelessness and unworthiness there. Mm -hmm. And I have not ever in my almost 10 years of being a relationship and life coach for women ever come across a woman who preferred married men mm -hmm. who did not fall into one of those two categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you gave some clarity on that because I'm just like, wow, yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, then there's there's some people that's like, you know, uh, you are gonna be my husband, you know, that whole thing. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and people like to dress it up. You know, you'll have some single women, young single women, who are like, well, I just want the money. I just want him to buy the things. He can go home to his wife. Right? You are not courageous enough to be emotionally vulnerable and available. And he is not emotionally vulnerable or available because he got to be that with his wife. So it works. So no matter how you dress it up or try to mask it, it comes down to one of those two things. Either you are emotionally unavailable because of hurt or fear, or you don't believe that you deserve it because you have feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness. Pick one. Ooh, we're going to make that a real. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so we're we're at the the second half of the show now. I, I want to have a little fun. I, I want I want like uh, a file uncut, right? Okay, that's, that's what this segment is. Be careful what you ask for. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay, and that, that's why I'm excited about having you on the show. Okay, so this is our bonus round. Uh, what is the biggest mistake you see most women make in relationships? Competing with their man. Ooh, 
Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Challenging his masculinity because so many of us women, especially if we've accomplished anything or just been black women or women of color in this society or, or a woman in general in this society, there's an aspect of life that forces us to be hypermasculine in order to succeed, in order to move through, in order to. And so many women, we get into relationships with men. And instead of relinquishing that masculinity, we challenge him in his masculinity. And we get into competition with the men in our lives. Instead of being able and being comfortable to then sit in your feminine energy or your femininity. But life has forced so many of us to be hypermasculine and to operate in this masculine state that the biggest mistake I see and one of the things that leads to the breakdown of relationships between good people is that so many women do not know how to be feminine in that environment. And so they challenge their man's masculinity. They compete with him in masculine ways. And at some point, both of the partners become overwhelmed and tired of playing those roles and it leads to breakdown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because and we hear about, you know, the feminine energy and, and different things like that. And I've heard some women say that they can only have feminine energy around certain men because they feel protected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, can you turn the, the femininity off and on? <laughs> you can't necessarily turn it off and on, mm -hmm. but that generally, so here's, here's what needs to happen in order for a woman to be comfortable in her feminine energy, to okay. rest in that. Mm -hmm. She has to feel safe. If she does not feel safe with a man, she is always going to be in self-protection mode. So she's always going to be guarding herself. And I'm not just talking about physical safety. Yeah. If she doesn't feel emotionally safe with him, mm -hmm. if she doesn't feel spiritually safe with him, if she doesn't feel mentally safe with him, then she's always going to be on guard and she's never going to be able to rest in her femininity. So men have work to do in this space because many of our men are no longer operating from a place of healthy masculinity either. So our men are operating in this hyper feminine energy. They want to be catty. They want to call you names. They're doing all these types of things. And then the women, we are trying to protect self. So there's all this kind of conflict that happens there. But what is important to do is to recognize that that's where you are and then begin a practice of creating the safety for yourself. This is for women. They have to restore the, the harmony and the balance if they've been hurt, if they've been abused. So many women specifically who have gone through sexual abuse are never able to feel safe around men, even when it's a safe space and the, men is, the man is being protective. So a lot of it has to do with healing your emotional trauma, uh, getting rid of your emotional triggers so that you are able to feel safe in your own body. And then you can choose men who help you to feel safe as well. But if a woman does not feel safe, she is just going to be a Tasmanian devil out here. <laughs> and this is not in my notes, but I'm, I'm hearing you talk. Why are why do we have so many feminine men? So I don't always want to be the black lady that goes back to oppression and slavery and all those things. But sometimes it has to be done. Of course. We have to really talk about what our community has experienced and how we were socialized and conditioned out of our natural, healthy ways of being. So when you strip a family apart, when you threaten the women with the death of the men and you threaten the men with the rape of the women, we begin to operate in unnatural and unhealthy ways for self-protection again, yep. right? And so now we fast forward to 2024, we've gone through that experience ancestrally. It's in our DNA. It's coded in our DNA. This is science and genetics. Mm -hmm. So we really have to realize that these unhealthy, unnatural, toxic behavioral patterns are encoded in our DNA. Mm -hmm. And so when we come together as individuals, 
the trauma that's in your DNA and the trauma that's in her DNA bonds. And so there's this disruption and this imbalance in how we show up energetically and emotionally. And we have so many hurt men. This is why they're operating from a hyper feminine space. We have so many men who were raised by women because their fathers were absent. And this is no slight to single mothers because I know that they've done the best that they can. But there comes a point in a young boy's life where he needs the masculine energy. And if he doesn't get that from a healthy father figure, he begins to resent his mother. He begins to blame her for the father not being there. And then when he's in relationships with other women, he's playing that resentment out, his hatred towards his mother, his upset towards his mother. And he is operating from a hyper feminine state because he was raised in a feminine environment. And one of the other reasons is because when women are raising boys, they often do not give them the discipline and the responsibility that they have to give them in order for them to build character and to recognize that work is important. It's part of your purpose. It's part of your duty. So things are offset because of what we have previously experienced and from some of the current things that we are experiencing as a community. However, I do want to say that I'm so proud of Black men and women. I see the work that we're doing to get better and how we are coming together, contrary to what you see on social media, because the algorithms are racist too. So let's not forget that. And keeping Black women and Black, black men and Black women divided is good for business. So good. Yeah, I was I was talking, I love that. I was talking to my sister-in-law the other day. And um there was a video that I wanted her to see. Um, it was a, a controversial video, but she told me she said, I wanted, she said, I would like to look at it. She said, but I don't want it to switch my algorithm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when because she said then they're that, gonna show you all of it. Yep. And I was like, smart woman. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, sometimes I even tell people, I'm like, look, all, you know, the gender war thing, men against women. I'm like, you just need to change your algorithm. Start celebrating more healthy stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you can, I can tell the way you act. You know, you can find out a lot about a person through their algorithm. Absolutely. You can learn who they really are at their core based on what's on their timeline. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So people are like, no, you can't have my passcode. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, from seeing your parents' relationship, what did it teach you about marriage? Oh, child, it taught me never to get married, never to trust a man. Don't do what your mama did because you don't want what your mama and daddy had. My parents' relationship was an absolute dysfunctional circus. And that experience scarred me, damaged me. And I was one of those hyper-independent, hyper-masculine women. Well, I don't need a man. I can do it on my own, right? And very proud of that. Um, my mother and father were both very young when they had me. They were in their teens. They were 17. Mm -hmm. I'm from New York City, grew up in the crack era, 80s and 90s. And so that's the environment that they were trying to build a marriage, a life, and a family in. Mm -hmm. And my father was a serial cheater serial cheater. I often tell folks, I never saw a healthy marriage between a black man and black woman in my life. And that's what made me create one. Mm. That's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. But it, it, it took work. There was yeah. so much that I had to unlearn and undo. Um, and because of my parents' marriage and my opposition to being feminine and to submission and building together, I gave my husband, you know, a run for his money. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Well, yeah. Kudos to you for having the courage to want to create change because it's easy to be like, well, this is what I saw my mama do. It's just easy mm -hmm. to kind of live, you know, that. So, no, it absolutely is. I am a very emotionally in tune woman. Mm -hmm. So I cannot be somewhere that disrupts me emotionally. So even though I was pretending to be a tough girl, mm -hmm. I was always the lover girl at heart. <laughs> so does that come with like 
age and maturity or, you know, like, is there a certain age that you can really just tap into that emotional maturity or is it just more of a surrounding, like being around certain people or, you know, is it, is it age? I think it's a combination of, of both. Mm -hmm. So for some women like myself, I have always been highly emotionally intuitive. I can feel other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. I can read people's energy without sounding a little bit kooky over here, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of information that I can gain from just looking at a person, being in a room with them. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it taught me really early on that I needed to learn how to manage my own emotions in order to feel good right? In order to have a good experience, I had to learn to manage how I was feeling and to avoid spaces that triggered me or had me all emotionally out of whack. Mm -hmm. That's something that happened for me very early on because I grew up in such an emotionally dysfunctional household. So sometimes that trauma is really teaching you how to be better, but you have to pick those good parts out and, and leave the rest. For most folks, I think it comes with time, mm -hmm. it comes with age, and it comes with intention. You have to, at some point, make a choice to say, I would like to have better, or I'd like to know that better is out there, or I want to experience something different. And that's the hardest part, because even when folks know this is not what they want, the fear of the unknown trumps the discomfort of the familiar. And this is why we have folks in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s who are still doing the same thing, getting the same results. And you can have a 20 year old who says, you know what, I want to do something different. So it's a combination of all of those factors. But the key thing is really making the decision to do something di different and being intentional about that. Yes, I love it. Yeah, my wife always say that. She's like, I can read it. I, I know when your energy's off. I know when, like, she, she be locked in. I'm like, listen to like, your wife. Yeah. She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. She like, whatever. <laughs> she already know. knows. She already know. I'm just like, am I, am I that visible? Like, can you really see me like that? <laughs> um, who makes a better spouse? Someone never married or someone divorced? Someone who chooses to be a good spouse, whether they've been married, not married, divorced or not divorced. Ooh, intentional. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Your past does not dictate your present or your future. Mm -hmm. So you get to decide if you're going to be a good spouse or not. Ooh, I love that. Great answer. What's harder for you to say, I apologize, I need help, I love you, or I was wrong? Oh, God, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I can say I love you all day. Mm -hmm. I can say I apologize as well. And I can hear my husband's voice in my head right now getting on my nerves and he's not even here. It is tough for me to say I was wrong. It used to be hardest for me to say I need help. I've learned through my own work, right? I've learned to be able to say I need help. Now I'm like, all the help, you can do it for me. <laughs> but the hardest thing for me now in this space that I'm still working on is to say, I was wrong. Because you can be like, all right, I apologize. But to acknowledge that you were wrong in a situation, that means that you have to get out of your ego. And let me say I, because I'm speaking for myself, it means I got to get out of my ego, move my bullshit to the side and give you the upper hand. So it is definitely a work in progress that I am wrong. Ooh, be boxing <laughs> me up sometimes. No, I get it. I yeah, I I struggle with ego sometimes. I just be like, oh my god, like really, you know. So no, I'm, I'm with you and be okay. struggling, gritting my teeth and everything. I'm like, yes. oh, where does this come from? <laughs> right, that's like the okay. I apologize, but you shouldn't have made me do <laughs> right all the excuses. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Last question: Is it easier to love yourself or someone else? Hmm. It's easier to love someone else once you love yourself. Mm. If you don't love yourself, mm -hmm. even what you think is loving someone else is not. Wow. Mm. We can end the show with that. <laughs> That's good. 
Yeah. That, <laughs> I, I don't even have nothing else to say. My God, mm. that's good. Ooh. Any, mm. any 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 closing comments? I'm I'm done. This Anything was so you... good. Yeah, that was a great way to. Oh my god, I'm gonna use that one. I'm gonna give Please you a credit, do. but I'm Please gonna. Do. Give you that one. <laughs> Please do. Yes. Yes. So, can you let everyone? Thank you so much for being a guest on today's show. I was excited. Like I, I get excited about a lot of guests, but this one, I was just like. I am oh, rock, so happy. Right? I'm so happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. I love to share. I love to have these conversations. So thank you for giving me the space and the opportunity. I appreciate it so very much. No problem. Can you let everyone know how they can get in touch with you, what you have going on, all that other good stuff? Of course. So you can find me across all platforms, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, at she is Phyla. So S H E I S and my first name S I L A at she is Phyla on my website as well at Phyla and twine. That's Phyla and then like an ant and wine. I know I'm I know I'm messing y'all up with this name child, but it, you'll be okay. Phyla and And um, I offer private coaching as well as group coaching opportunities for women, professional women who have it all together, but the relationship component is missing. Love it. Love it. Well, you heard it here, Brave Hearts community. I'll have everything linked up in the description below. So make sure you get in touch with Isla because as you can see, she dropped so many wisdom bombs today. I'm just like, I'm I'm done. So make sure you connect with everything I will have linked in the description. If you are watching this via YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Share this with a friend. Look, if you are in your group chats and your, with your girlfriends and your guy friends, you know, y'all have like seven to eight people in there. Put this video in there because, uh, you know, you might want to get married one day and you just like, you know what? Let me watch this video real quick. So share it with your friends. Uh, if you are listening to this via podcast, uh, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We'd we'll love to hear from you. By doing so, leaving a rating and review will put you on a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff? So this has been a phenomenal episode. Thank you, Violet, for your time.